Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Finding Pathologic T-Cells in Rheumatoid Arthritis by Mass Cytometry, presented by Deepak Rao, MD, PhD, with a technology introduction by Michelle Poulin, PhD. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Fluidime. Fluidime develops, manufactures, and markets life science analytical and preparatory systems for markets such as mass cytometry, high-throughput genomics, and single-cell genomics. We sell to leading academic institutions, clinical research laboratories, and pharmaceutical biotechnology and agricultural biotechnology companies worldwide. Our systems are based on proprietary microfluidics and multi-parameter mass cytometry technology and are designed to significantly simplify experimental workflow, increase throughput, and reduce costs while providing excellent data quality. Fluidine products are provided for research use only, not for use in diagnostic procedures. To learn more about Fluidine, please visit www.fluidine.com. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice you'll be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. Finally, if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know you're having a problem. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Michelle Poulin earned her bachelor's degree from Smith College and her PhD in immunology from the University of Colorado, Denver. After completing a postdoctoral fellowship at National Jewish Health in 2003, she joined BD Biosciences as an instructor in the Customer Education Department. In 2012, Dr. Poulin joined DVS Sciences as a field applications scientist and became manager of the North American Field Application Scientist team shortly after DVS was acquired by Fluidime in 2014. Dr. Deepak Rao is an instructor in medicine and co-director of the Human Immunology Center at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. After completing undergraduate studies at Harvard University, he obtained an MD and a PhD in immunology immunobiology from the Yale University School of Medicine, where he studied human T-cell responses to transplanted organs in the laboratory of Dr. Jordan Pober. He then completed his internal medicine residency and rheumatology fellowship training at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Rao received the 2014 American College of Rheumatology Distinguished Fellow Award and the 2016 Rheumatology Research Foundation Malawista Endowment designation for his research characterizing lymphocyte abnormalities in patients with rheumatic diseases. His work employs high-dimensional and functional analyses of T cells in blood and tissue samples from patients with rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and other rheumatic diseases. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Poulin. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you, Judy. Um, in advance of Dr. Rao's presentation, I'd like to give you an introduction to mass cytometry. As you know, biology is very heterogeneous, and biological systems consist of heterogeneous cell types, each with diverse functions and functional states. This complexity demands high-dimensional proteomics panels that can simultaneously measure both the breadth and depth of the system with single cell resolution. Mass cytometry enables this with the ability to look at more than 50 parameters on millions of cells. It uniquely enables the discovery of new biology as well as comprehensive functional profiling across a broad range of research areas, including basic research, drug discovery, and clinical research. To discuss mass cytometry in a bit more detail, I'll go through the five elements of mass cytometry. First is metals. We utilize metals as tags on our probes, and we currently have more than 50 high-purity metal isotope tags available. 
because of the purity of these isotopic tags, there is minimal background from signal overlap between isotopes. And because these metals do not occur naturally in biological systems, there is no background from endogenous cellular components. These metals, when attached to probes, can be combined into panels. To do this, we have available our MAXPAR antibodies. Fluidon has a catalog of more than 600 pre-conjugated antibodies at this time with specificity to both human and mouse markers. These are against both phenotype, uh, phenotypic and functional markers and can be purchased individually or as part of panel kits. In addition, we offer 35 labeling kits so that you can conjugate your own antibodies with these metal tags. And Fluidime also has custom conjugation services available. In addition to antibody probes, we also sell cell ID reagents such as barcoding and cisplatin as a live dead indicator. Once the panel has been designed, your cells are then stained with this panel by protocols very similar to what you may currently use for flow cytometry. The stained cells are then introduced into the Helios mass cytometer where they will pass through a high energy plasma which will ionize each cell. The resulting ions will then be read by a single detector and all of these ions can be separated with a resolution of one Dalton. The Helios mass cytometer has a mass range from 75 to 209 Daltons, allowing the measurement of 135 channels. This allows for measurement of all of our existing tags and any reagents that we develop in the future. This means that they can be added to your current panel without any upgrade to the instrument hardware. Finally, the Helios collects multi-parametric data for large numbers of cells per sample, enabling proteomic profiling for a breadth of cell types all in a single tube. To finish off, I'd just like to show you the mass cytometry publication ramp. As you'll see, over the last several years, there's been a huge increase in peer-reviewed um, publications utilizing mass cytometry technology showing that it is enabling research across a range of research fields around the world. Thank you, and I'll pass this back to Judy. Thank you, Dr. Poulin, for your presentation. We will now hear from Dr. Rao. Thank you, Judy. It's my pleasure today to talk with you about our work using mass cytometry to find pathologic T cells in rheumatoid arthritis. I have no disclosures. I've structured the talk today in three parts. In the first part, I'll describe our, our overall approach to using CYTOF to study inflamed tissues and blood and autoimmune diseases. In the second part, I'll tell you a story about a, a particular example that we've published recently identifying a unique population of T cells in rheumatoid arthritis samples. And then lastly, I'll, I'll mention the use of CYTOF in a consortium, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership, that studies rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. So in human translational studies, in particular those that are focused on diseases, it's often important to obtain samples from patients affected with that condition. That can be tissue samples, it can be blood samples, and in our studies we tend to use both. Whenever we can, we emphasize getting tissue samples because they're tremendously useful. The examples in, in the autoimmune diseases are, uh, for example, synovium and rheumatoid arthritis, kidney biopsies and lupus nephritis, skin and psoriasis, the gut and inflammatory bowel disease. The challenge here is that these tissues are difficult to obtain oftentimes, uh, and typically they're quite small, so you may only end up with a, a few thousand, tens of thousands of cells. The sample preparation is challenging because it typically involves digesting the tissue to generate a single cell suspension. 
But the benefit is that one's able to directly assay the active immune response. Because of the challenges in dealing with tissue, we oftentimes rely on analyses of peripheral blood as well. And because of these difficulties, we think that it's likely that peripheral blood will remain the primary source for analyzing immune cells in clinical practice. Of course, blood is easily, it's easily obtained. It provides a lot of cells from 10 to 50 milliliters blood. One can obtain 10 to 50 million peripheral blood mononuclear cells. The blood can be sampled longitudinally and repeatedly over time. And there is the possibility to capture activated immune cells that are in transit in the circulation, in particular if you know what you're looking for. Our general approach employs two complementary strategies. And for one, we use CYTOF to generate detailed cellular phenotypes in a sample. And in parallel, and often in sequence, we'll use traditional flow cytometry to sort cells of interest. So for example, with CYTOF, where one can analyze a sample in substantial detail to characterize populations, um, we'll use this to identify subpopulations of immune cells that are expanded or depleted in patient samples relative to controls. Once we've identified populations that are of interest, then we'll focus on those and sort them by flow cytometry for additional studies, either RNA sequencing analyses by low input RNA seq transcriptomics, single cell transcriptomics, and functional analyses. So let me tell you then about how, how we've used the strategy in the disease of rheumatoid arthritis. So by way of background, rheumatoid arthritis is a prototypical autoimmune disease directed against the joints. It's common in that it affects up to 1% of the population. And what you see in the slide here is an example on the left of what normal synovium looks like. Here we're looking inside a knee by arthroscopy. And though it's difficult to appreciate, there is a thin synovial lining that covers the joint. In rheumatoid arthritis, this thin lining is the target of the inflammatory response, and it becomes hyperplastic, it becomes hypervascular, it's infiltrated with immune cells, and that synovium then starts to expand and, and invade into the surrounding structures where it really shouldn't be. So it degrades the cartilage, it begins to degrade the bone, and this causes ultimately destruction of the joint. We can schematize the inflammatory response in the joint here with this cartoon that highlights three aspects of the inflammatory process. So on the bottom left, you can see uh, the depiction of an accumulation of T cells and B cells. This is a typical finding in rheumatoid arthritis. And those T cells and B cells produce factors that then activate and recruit additional innate immune cells like macrophages, mast cells. The inflammatory response then initiates a reaction from the synovial fibroblasts that line the joint. Those fibroblasts become activated, they begin to proliferate, and as depicted on the right, you can see um, uh, illustrated the idea that those synovial fibroblasts invade into the cartilage. They interact with osteoclasts that then um, stimulate destruction of the bone. So we've been interested to try and assay the various cell populations that participate in this inflammatory response broadly. And one of the methods we've, that we've used to do that is, is mass cytometry or cytosol. So our typical workflow is to obtain synovial tissue, that's the joint tissue, either um, at the time of arthroplasty, when a patient undergoes a joint replacement and that tissue becomes available, or through research protocol synovial biopsies. In either case, we digest the tissue to generate a single cell suspension. And here we've analyzed samples with a, a mass cytometry panel. The panel is shown on the right and you can see that it includes markers to identify stromal cells like fibroblasts with markers like protoplanin, cadherin 11, FAP. It identifies endothelial cells with markers like CE cadherin. And then it includes a large number of markers to identify leukocyte populations and subpopulations therein. 
So on the left side of this, of this slide, what you see is a VISNI visualization of mass cytometry data from a synovial tissue sample. Here, in this type of visualization, each dot is a cell, and the cells are arranged in this two-dimensional plot based on how similar they are to one another in a multidimensional way. And the upshot is that cells that are similar to one another end up clustered together in an island of sorts. In these plots, the color represents the level of expression of the marker that's labeled at the top. So here in the top left-hand panel uh, it represents the expression of CD3. And you can see that there are, are two T cell populations identified by CD3. One of those populations also expresses CD4 here, so those are the CD4 T cells. And in contrast, there's another population here that expresses CD8. Those are the CD8 positive T cells. You can also make out fibroblasts, which express protoplanin down here on the bottom left, and monocytes or macrophages in the top right, identified by the expression of CD14. So you can appreciate that with this one visualization of the Cytoc data, you can uh, recognize multiple populations of cells, both leukocytes and stromal cells. You also can get a sense that within some of these populations, there's heterogeneity. So for example, in the CD4s, there are at least two populations that are easily identified and others within there as well. We can look at the same type of data by traditional biaxial gating. Here again, looking at mass cytometry data from a synovial tissue sample. Now, rather than using a multidimensional visualization tool, we're just looking at uh, biaxial plots of, of particular markers of interest. So again, we can resolve fibroblast and leukocytes based on the expression of protoplanin and CD45 in the top left. If we follow, follow the leukocytes, we can again see monocytes or macrophages identified by CD14, T cells by CD3. And on the right, we can see the CD3 positive T cells divided into CD4s and CD8s, just as you'd expect, and resolved quite nicely. And of course, we can go further and identify the heterogeneity within these populations. So for the fibroblast, we can see that there are different populations that might be identified based on here, the expression of CD90 and CD34. Amongst the monocytes or macrophages, we can clearly see a distinct population that expresses a high level of CCR2. Among this population, which are neither T cells nor monocytes, as expected, we see many cells that express CD19, so those are the B cells, and a heterogeneity amongst the B cells, including a population with bright expression of CD38, which may suggest that these are plasma cells or plasma blasts in the population. And of course, amongst the CD4 cells, we can resolve uh, subpopulations as well. Here, showing, for example, a population with bright expression of PD1 also expressing CCR2. And so in the next few minutes, what we'll focus on is heterogeneity within the CD4 T cell population. So let me tell you first for a minute why focus on the CD4 cells in rheumatoid arthritis. So a, a couple of points about this. So first, the genetics in rheumatoid arthritis strongly point towards CD4 cells as important players. That is that the strongest risk alleles for rheumatoid arthritis encode MEC class II molecules, the primary purpose of which are to present antigen to CD4 T cells. We know that rheumatoid arthritis synovium, as I told you, is often heavily infiltrated with CD4 T cells. And we know clinically that blocking T cell activation with a medication, a Batacept, which is CTLA-4-IG, effectively treats rheumatoid arthritis in many patients. So the case for an important role for CD4s is quite strong. However, the key pathologic effector functions of CD4 cells in rheumatoid arthritis have remained generally unclear. So we've been interested to explore the potential functions of different T cell populations that infiltrate the joints in, in rheumatoid arthritis. One way we've approached this is using mass cytometry now to try and identify subpopulations of T cells within these samples um, with the hope of identifying populations that are particularly important in driving pathology. So what's shown on this slide is Again, mass cytometry data 
uh, of a sample obtained from a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, a joint sample. And here what we've done is we've focused only on the CD4 T cells. So this is gated on CD4 positive, CD3 positive T cells, and we've stripped away all the other cells. And then we focus the Visney analysis on this population. So again, each dot is the cell. The cells are arranged in a, on the two-dimensional plot based on how similar they are to one another in a multi-dimensional way. And the color represents the level of expression of the marker at the top. So you can see um, what, what, I've, what I've laid out here is the expression of five different markers that are sometimes considered activation markers on T cells, or markers that should suggest that the T cell has been activated uh, in the recent past. And for one, you can appreciate that the expression patterns are different for these different markers. So for example, CD69 is fairly broadly expressed by the T cells in the joint, whereas CD38 shows a much more restricted pattern. What stood out to us here is this large population of T cells with quite bright expression of PD-1. You can see that some of those cells co-express MHC class two, some of them co-express ICOS, so we were interested in trying to understand this population better. If we use traditional biaxial gating, you can identify the same population. So here it's the same, uh, same sample, the same data, now just shown in biaxial gates. And if we gate on the CD4 T cells, you can see a population with very bright expression of PD-1, oftentimes co-expressing MHC class two, oftentimes co-expressing ICOS. And this is quantified on the right in six different donors. And we've used a couple of complementary strategies to try and validate these results and, and um, demonstrate them in different ways. So here, shown on this slide, is now flow cytometry analysis, not of synovial tissue, but of synovial fluid. So this is joint fluid, it's inflamed fluid that comes out of the joints of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. These may be obtained by a clinician who's treating the patient. And quite satisfyingly, we could similarly see a population of T cells with very bright PD-1 expression here by flow cytometry of synovial fluid. Um, and um, you can appreciate that this population almost, almost uh, um, displays a distinct uh, uh, pattern by flow cytometry, almost a distinct uh, level of expression compared to the rest of the cells. Interestingly, um, these cells were identified as expanded in patients with seropositive rheumatoid arthritis, which means rheumatoid arthritis where the patients have an autoantibody, either a rheumatoid factor antibody or an anti-CCP antibody, and really not expanded in patients that have inflammatory arthritis that's not associated with an autoantibody, and that could be negative rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile arthritis. So the distinction here um, at a cytometric level between seropositive RA and seronegative arthritis is really quite striking. And I'm, I'm not sure there's another marker that makes this distinction as well. As another complementary approach, we used immunofluorescence microscopy to see if we could detect the same types of cells within the tissue and, and learn something about their localization. So here, what's shown is confocal microscopy of a synovial biopsy sample. On the bottom, on, on the left panel, uh, you can see most of the panel is taken up by the tissue itself. And you can see this aggregate of immune cells. The B cells are in green, the T cells are in red, and the PD-1 expressing T cells are in blue. So in the merge, one can see that there are a number of purple cells, which are, which are PD-1 positive T cells, and oftentimes they're closely approximated to B cells in the sample. So now by three different approaches, we've been able to identify a population of T cells with bright PD-1 expression within the synovium. So we then spent quite, amount, uh, quite a fair amount of time trying to understand, well, what are these cells? What might they do? And we considered a few possibilities. So one possibility is that these are sort of generally activated T cells. Another possibility is that they're exhausted or dysfunctional T cells. And a third possibility that we considered is that these are follicular helper T cells, a specific subset of CD4 cells. 
me just say a word about follicular helper cells. So follicular helper cells are typically identified as CXCR5 positive, PD1 positive cells. They're well known to promote B cell recruitment and maturation in follicles and lymph nodes. They produce typically IL-21 and CXCL-13, which is the ligand for CXCR5. And they characteristically express a high level of a transcription factor BCL6. So we're interested to ask, are the PD-1 high cells in synovial tissue, are these follicular helper cells? And we did this by looking for CXCR5. And the answer here is really no, that while, um, while you can see cells with quite high PD-1 expression in synovial fluid or synovial tissue here shown at the top on the left, most of these cells do not express CXCR5. And this is in contrast to, to tonsil as a positive control on the right. We quantified this in nine different synovial fluid donors and 10 different synovial tissue samples. And the observation is really that the vast majority of the PD-1 high cells in synovium do not express CXCR5. And so we wouldn't consider them follicular helper T cells. We then tried to ask further about the potential function of these cells. And the way that we did this was to sort PD-1 high and PD-1 negative populations out of synovial fluid samples from rheumatoid arthritis patients. So what's shown here is RT-PCR of sorted subpopulations of cells. And the cells are sorted based on whether they expressed PD-1 or not, and then again subdivided based on whether they co-expressed MHC class 2 or not. The interesting thing about this was that while the PD-1 high cells did not express high, higher levels of IL-2, they expressed much higher levels of IL-21 and CXCL-13 relative to PD-1 negative T cells. So here, the IL-21 is about 100-fold increased, CXCL-13 1,000-fold increased. And the expression of these two molecules suggested a potential role as B cell helpers, in that these are factors that are typically associated with follicular helper T cells. We confirm this by intracellular cytokine staining here, sorting, again, PD-1 negative cells, PD-1 high cells, and this time PD-1 intermediate cells as well. Sort them, keep them in vitro, stimulate them, and then analyze cytokine expression by intracellular cytokine staining. And the observation is the same, that the PD-1 high cells on the right in each plot, they don't express much IL-2, but they express more frequently express IL-21 and much more frequently express CXCL-13. Given the production of these two molecules, we suspected that, that PD-1 high cells out of the synovium may be able to interact with B cells and promote B cell responses. And in fact, that's the case. So we sorted PD-1 high cells or PD-1 negative cells out of synovial tissue, out of synovial fluid, and also out of blood, co-cultured them with memory B cells, and stimulated these cultures in vitro for a week and asked about the ability of the T cells to drive B cell differentiation into plasma cells. And the observation is that from all three sites, these PD-1 high cells are most able to induce B cell differentiation into plasma cells. So what I've told you so far is that by mass cytometry, we identified that Seropositive rheumatoid arthritis synovium is infiltrated by a large population of PD-1 high CXCR5 negative CD4 cells, and that these cells express IL-21 and CXCL-13, and they promote plasma cell differentiation in vitro. So we were then interested to ask, well, how do these cells differ from T follicular helper cells? We did this by a couple of approaches. So one approach was to look at the expression of some of the key transcription factors here done by intracellular, cytokine, uh, intracellular flow cytometry. On the left is looking at the expression of BCL6 versus BLIMP1, and on the right is looking at the expression of MAF. These are assayed in both synovial fluid cells and synovial tissue cells, and the cells are divided based on the expression of PD-1 and CXCR5. And what you can appreciate is that, as expected, the PD-1 high CXCR5 positive cells from synovial fluid or from synovial tissue in this case, these are the follicular helper cells. They express a very high ratio of BCL6 to BLIMP1. This is what would be predicted. But in contrast, 
the PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells, the cells I've been telling you about, these cells do not express an elevated ratio of BCL6 to BLIMP1. And in fact, they express a somewhat higher level of BLIMP1 than the rest of the cells. So indicating a difference in the expression of these two key transcription factors in this population. At the same time, when we looked at mass expression, both PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells and PD-1 high CXCR5 positive cells show an elevated level of expression of MAF, which is relevant because this is a transcription factor that's known to drive expression of IL-21. So both shared and distinct features looking at the level of transcription factor expression. We approach this question more broadly, again turning to mass cytometry. So here we've analyzed cells CD4 T cells from peripheral blood samples and um, study them with a mass cytometry panel that includes 34 markers, including many markers to help subset populations of CD4 cells. Um, again, what's shown is a, a Visney visualization of the data. And um, what stood out from these analyses is that the cells with high PD-1 expression tended to cluster together in this type of analysis and that some of them would co-express CXCR5 uh, while others wouldn't. But at the same time, the, the PD-1 high cells with and without CXCR5 tended to end up in the same area. And so what, what I'm talking about is this spot here, where within this pink circle, you can appreciate that there are some CXCR5 positive cells um, that are sitting right adjacent to many cells that do not express CXCR5, and they're unified by high expression of PD-1. So it suggests that these cells, when you consider a sort of multidimensional phenotype, are quite similar um, ac across the panel. And again, we can, we can identify some heterogeneity within these populations. We're then able to ask about the differences or similarities in the level of expression of many other markers that are included in the mass cytometry panel. So when we've compared PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells to PD-1 high CXCR5 positive cells, there is a similarly increased expression of a couple of markers, for example, ICOS. At the same time, uh, there are a couple of proteins that stand out as quite different. So CCR7 expression is lower in the CXCR5 negative cells than the CXCR5 positive cells. Um, and on the other hand, TBET is higher in the CXCR5 negative cells compared to the CXCR5 positive ones. So we use mass cytometry here to assess broadly a number of markers of particular interest to try and identify differences and similarities between these two populations. To complement this analysis, uh, we took an even broader approach, which is, which is uh, to use low input RNA sequencing. So here we've sorted eight different populations of memory CD4 T cells, subdivided based on their expression or lack of expression of PD-1, CXCR5, ICOS, and MHC class 2. You can see how they've been divided at the bottom. Um, we sorted these cells from, we sorted eight different populations from four different rheumatoid arthritis patients. And what's shown here is a principal components analysis to look at the sort of global relationship of these cell populations. And the observation that comes out is that the cells with high PD-1 expression without CXCR5 tend to cluster together these are represented in the fire colors at the bottom. And they're robustly separated from the PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells, the CXCR5 positive cells, which are at the top. And these are the cells in green that we would consider, I think, unambiguously follicular helper T cells. The, the difference between these two populations, or their separation in the plot, suggests that there are major global transcriptomic differences that go beyond just the expression of CXCR5, yes or no. So here, using three different approaches, one, specifically assaying transcription factors, two, using mass cytometry to analyze proteins of interest, and three, using a broad um, transcriptomic approach, we can identify both shared features and distinct features between these two populations. When we asked about differentially expressed genes, between PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells and PD-1 high CXCR5 positive cells, interestingly, one set of genes stood out to us 
are a set of chemokine receptors. So the CXCR5 negative cells have a much higher expression of CCR2, for example, than the follicular helper cells. And it sort of makes sense. So follicular helper cells express CXCR5, and the CXCR5 negative cells express a different cohort of chemokine receptors. And in this case, there are a set of chemokine receptors that are associated with migration to inflamed tissues. We confirmed this observation for a few of these proteins. Um, here, I think, most strikingly for CCR2. So what's shown here is, again, flow cytometry data looking at T cells that have come out of a rheumatoid arthritis tissue sample. And as I've shown you before, you can see a large population of T cells with high PD-1 expression without CXCR5. This is shown on the left. And when we look at those same cells and ask about the expression of CCR2, you can appreciate that there's about half of them that express CCR2. So this is interesting because it's a population of cells that expresses, not only do they lack CXCR5, they express a different chemokine receptor, but as we've shown in vitro, they are functional at helping B cell maturation and differentiation. I alluded to this in the past couple of slides, but we're also, this is to show explicitly that we're also able to find these PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells in the blood. And here on the left, you can see a Visney visualization of cells from a synovial fluid sample, a blood sample from the same patient. And there are in the blood cells with high PD-1 expression with a similar multidimensional phenotype. They're just much rarer in the blood than in the fluid or tissue. So if you know what you're looking for, you can find them, but it's difficult to detect them sort of broadly otherwise. And indeed, in the blood, if you quantify the frequency of these cells, they are increased specifically in the patients with seropositive rheumatoid arthritis, shown on the right, um, and, and not really in patients with seronegative arthritis or spondyloarthropathies, that's the SPA. So consistent with the synovial fluid findings, this is a population that's specifically enriched in seropositive RA. We remain interested in trying to understand what are the features in seropositive rheumatoid arthritis patients that may be associated with an expanded frequency of these cells. And this is showing some of our initial analyses to, to get at this question. So on the left, you can see that the rheumatoid arthritis patients have been divided based on having low disease activity or higher disease activity. And those patients with the highest frequencies tend to have uh, high disease activity, shown here. And separately, in a, in a different cohort of patients where we were able to get blood samples longitudinally here before starting a new treatment and after starting a new treatment, we saw a reduction in the frequency of the PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells in patients who were successfully treated with a new therapy. So it suggests that the frequency of these cells is higher in patients with active disease and that it can come down with successful treatment. So let me su summarize what I've shown you here to say that starting with mass cytometry, we identified a markedly expanded population of PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells in rheumatoid arthritis, that these cells express IL-21 and CXCL-13 and show the ability to help B cells, and yet they have a distinct transcriptional and proteomic signature from follicular helper cells characterized in particular by a unique migratory capacity suggested by the expression of different chemokine receptors. I've also shown you that by immunofluorescence microscopy, we can see these cells in the tissues, oftentimes adjacent to B cells. And then in looking at the circulation, we find these cells expanded in the blood of patients with active rheumatoid arthritis and that the frequency decreases with therapy. So, I'd like to just take a minute to sort of put these findings in the context of what's been described. So we're familiar with the idea of a follicular helper T cell that expresses CXCR5 and it follows the, it, the ligand CXCL13 into lymph node follicles. And there in a lymph node follicle, it interacts with B cells by producing factors like IL-21 and CXCL13 to help drive a germinal center reaction. And what we would suggest is that there's a distinct population of T cells similarly identified by high PD-1 expression 
But in this, in this case, expressing a different set of chemokine receptors, ones that take cells not to lymphoid follicles, but to inflamed peripheral sites. Here, for example, the joint. Within the joint, these cells, which we are calling peripheral helper T cells, may interact with B cells similarly, produce some of the same factors, but in fact drive a local antibody production, local B cell response, which is different from the process that goes on in, in lymph nodes. So we've suggested, just as there are follicular helper T cells that go to follicles, we've suggested that we might consider these cells peripheral helper T cells that go to peripheral tissues. In the last minute or two, let me just comment on then the use of these kinds of strategies more broadly in a, in a multi-site consortium. So we participate in a consortium called the Accelerating Medicines Partnership in RA and SLE. The emphasis is to work on rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. And the, the network is really uh, spurred by an NIH industry partnership to use high dimensional analyses to study patient samples in detail. The, the network is employing CYTOF. It's also employing RNA sequencing using single cell and low input methodologies. And the emphasis is really to study tissue and in, in, in parallel to study blood to look for key pathologic pathways and potential new biomarkers. In rheumatoid arthritis, as I've been showing you here, the emphasis is to look at the synovial tissue. And in lupus, the emphasis is to look at the kidney and also to some extent looking at the skin. CYTOF has a substantial role in the network in that for both rheumatoid arthritis patients and lupus patients, as well as controls that are recruited, uh, there's a large CYTOF analysis that's planned for blood samples using both peripheral blood mononuclear cells as well as total leukocytes, which is meant to imply, which, I, which actually is uh, peripheral blood where the red cells have been lysed, but the granulocytes remain intact. So it allows one to analyze both mononuclear cells and granulocytes. We're using multiple panels to do this. Um, for example, a panel that's focused on T cells, a separate panel focused on B cells, a separate panel focused on myeloid markers. In addition, CYTOF is an important aspect of the analysis of rheumatoid arthritis synovium. So um, much, much like what I've shown you, the network is interested in using CYTOF to analyze cell populations in rheumatoid arthritis tissue uh, obtained uh, at times through arthropla arthroplasties, which is mostly what I've shown you, and also now with a particular emphasis on trying to study synovial biopsies of RA patients that can be obtained oftentimes earlier in disease uh, or from more focused uh, patient populations. And we use osteoarthritis tissue as a comparator. And uh, though, though I think many, many folks in the network will have different ways to frame it, my way of thinking about the goals of these studies are to identify cell populations or phenotypes that drive pathology in rheumatoid arthritis, and in addition to identify cellular alterations that define distinct subsets of rheumatoid arthritis patients. And I think CYTOF is a very promising way to go about uh, asking these questions. Let me conclude by acknowledging the Many people who are involved in the T cell studies that I showed you, this work is mentored by Michael Brenner with important contributions members of his lab. Uh, the informatics work is co-mentored by Shoma Rishadri with um, help from graduate students in his lab, Camille Slowakowski and Chamath Fonseca. The arthroplasty tissue analyses are done in collaboration with the Hospital for Special Surgery. And the microscopy work is done uh, in collaboration with the University of Birmingham, done by Jennifer Marshall, uh, working with Chris Buckley and Andrew Feiler. And I'm indebted to a number of, of contributors at Brigham and Women's Hospital for helping to support this translational immunology program. And my funding support is listed at the bottom. And I also want to recognize the participants on the rheumatoid arthritis side in the Accelerating Medicines Partnership who are making some of these studies possible, uh, contributing samples, expertise, and analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Poulin and Dr. Rao for your informative presentations. It's
time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Poulin and or Dr. Rao, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Our first question is for Dr. Poulin. What other probes besides metal-labeled antibodies can be used in mass cytometry analysis? Thanks, Judy. Um, we have several different reagents that are not antibody-based. Um, we have two nucleic acid intercalators, uh, one iridium and one rhodium labeled, that allow for uh, cell identification. Um, we also have um, iododeoxyuridine to look at S phase cells if you're doing cell cycle studies. We utilize cisplatin as a live dead discriminator. Um, and we also have barcoding reagents that allow you to multiplex up to 20 samples um, and process and run as a single sample leading to better data consistency. The next one is for Dr. Rao. Can you comment on if and how enzymatic digestion impact markers? I'm sorry. Can you comment on if and how enzymatic digestion impacts marker expression? Yeah, this is a good question. So um, this is something that we have to pay attention to when we're dissociating samples. That is, is the enzymatic digestion cleaving off markers of interest. Um, and uh, it can be particularly problematic. Um, so we spent a fair amount of time trying to optimize digestion conditions to not lose um, critical markers. So CD4 tends to be one that's particularly susceptible to cleavage. Um, for, um, uh, so, so it takes some fiddling. And we had optimized this to try and reduce the digestion times and lower the digestion uh, enzyme concentrations to not lose markers of interest. Um, for ones that were particularly important, then we would validate that we hadn't cleaved them off. So for example, here, we sorted PD-1 high CXCR5 negative cells and PD-1 high CXCR5 positive cells, sorted them, and then RT-PCR to show that the CXCR5 transcript is only in the cells with a positive surface marker, not, not uh, cells that lack the marker. Um, Digestion time courses can help you to see if you're losing markers slowly um, th through the course of the dissociation, um, but, it is, but it is an issue that one has to pay attention to. Dr. Rao, how do you prepare cells from synovial fluid for flow or mass cytometry? For example, do you uh, fly call or clean it up in some other way? Sure. So there's, um, uh, there's a couple ways to do it. For these studies, we have FICALD them. So we put them over a density centrifugation to try and eliminate the granulocytes. In synovial fluid from inflammatory arthritis patients, the vast majority of the cells are, are neutrophils. And so to analyze the other mononuclear cell populations, it's helpful to, to remove the neutrophils first. So we did, we FICALD them and processed them um, in, in more or less the same way that we treated the blood samples. So in both cases, we would FICOL them, cryopreserve the mononuclear cells, and then thaw them out and analyze them in batches. Uh, it doesn't have to be done that way. If you're interested in the neutrophils, you can, you can certainly analyze the total population. But this is how we did it. Dr. Rao, how much synovium and cell per sample are normally obtained from a procedure? Um, so this this depends. Uh, for if we're talking about synovial, so let me answer the simple question first, which is maybe not what you're asking. In synovial fluid, um, it's the number of mononuclear cells is sort of for inflammatory fluid. It's sort of roughly proportional to blood. So you know you can estimate somewhere between you know half a million and a million cells per mil. Um, for synovial tissue, it um, it depends how you're getting the tissue. So from arthroplasties, the joint replacements, you get a fair amount of tissue, and there you can end up with um, you know, millions of synovial cells in total. And if it's an infiltrated sample, you end up with more cells. If it's a relatively bland sample, you end up with fewer. Um, for the efforts, in particular in the AMP network, where there's a pursuit of synovial biopsies, there, the amount of tissue that's collected is much smaller, um, 
And it depends on the details of how you're doing the biopsy and what's the method used to acquire the tissue. But, um, you know, it's, it's more in the range of a few hundred thousand cells to up, you know, up to a million cells or two. For this next one, uh, Dr. Poulin, could you take it first, and then Dr. Rao, could you comment as well? I have heard about imaging mass cytometry. Would this be possible to use on synovial tissue? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, early access users of the new imaging mass cytometer have not specifically looked at synovium, but um, they've used a wide array of um, tissues, both um, formalin fixed, paraffin embedded, as well as fresh frozen. Um, and some have even looked at cell spread. So there's no reason that synovial tissue could not also be processed and analyzed by imaging mass cytometry. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it would be really, that, that would be neat to do. Okay, next, this next one is for Dr. Rao. Based on your experience, how much expression correlation of surface marker in immune cells between RNA and protein data are you observing? Um, I, I guess the, in general, at the bulk, I mean, at the bulk level, uh, if, if you're comparing um, RNA expression at the, at the bulk level between sorted populations and the surface markers on those cells, um, you know, those correlations seem to me to be pretty good. Uh, I think maybe the question is more pointed at the correlation between single cell mass cytometry and single cell RNA sequencing, you know, transcriptomics. In that case, um, you know, I think it's it's an evolving field and an, and a um, uh, not necessarily a question that I have an answer to, but um, one that's of interest, you know. And I just mentioned that the ability to, um, well, I think it, we'll, we'll see how that evolves, but um, uh, at least at the bulk level here for the specific targeted proteins we've looked at, um, the correlations have been quite good. Dr. Rao, will you also be doing phosphate flow on the rheumatoid arthritis synovial tissue sample? samples, and if so, what do you think are some of the key signaling components to include? Uh, so phospho flow is not, not part, or, you know, phospho signaling analyses are not part of, um, uh, you know, the, our, our top priorities, although I think they're interesting studies to do. Um, the, the, I think the pathways that would come to mind in terms of responses to inflammatory signals in the joint are, are you know, key ones of interest. Uh, and I'm interested to see what people will find there. And Dr. Rao, this next one is for you too. Did you find more activated B cells or plasma blasts in patients with high PD-1 and CXCR5? Only half of the rheumatoid arthritis patients had high PD-1 and CXCR5 cells. Any correlation of this population with clinical outcome? Right. Good. Good question. So uh, it, it, it's a good point. Um, you know, there's a there's a range of frequencies of peripheral helper cells in the circulation of RA patients, and um, what explains that range is is a question of interest. So, to some extent, you know, there's some association with disease activity. So, so as I showed you, the patients with higher disease activity tend to have higher frequencies, although it's not a perfect correlation. Um, it is it, it is the case also that um, you know, roughly speaking, we tend to see more plasma blasts in patients that have high peripheral helper cell frequencies, but, um, but, but not, a, not a great correlation as we look in relatively small numbers of patients. Um, we're interested then in additional potential implications of the, an expanded population of peripheral helper cells. That is, does it help you predict a response to particular therapies? Does it help you predict um, um, particular manifestations of rheumatoid arthritis, and, and that's some of the ongoing work that we're doing. Okay. Uh, for Dr. Rao, can you comment on other disease types where this PD-1 high CXCR5 CD4 population might be found to be expanded? Oh, yeah, we would love to know. So this is that we're interested to see um, in, in other autoimmune inflammatory diseases, is there an expansion of this population of cells? Um, I'm... I will be interested to hear what people see in their own data sets where I'm sure there are um, data sets that have been generated in multiple diseases that probably have 
um, you know, the markers in them to try and ask this question. Okay, and this next one is for you, Dr. Rao. One major limitation of Cytos seems to be that at least 50% of labeled cells are not detected using Cytos, whereas loss with flow cytometry is only about 10%. How is this being addressed? And there's a little more too, but maybe you should answer that first. So I, I agree that the, the losses in processing are higher with Cytos than with flow cytometry. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of the reasons, actually, when we have very small sample inputs, we tend to prefer running them by flow cytometry because you can get more of the cells through to the cytometer. Um, you know, it's balanced against the, the advantages of CYTOF where you can measure many more parameters in the same sample. Um, I wonder if Michelle can speak to some of the technical parts of it, but, but I, I agree that it's, it's one of the considerations when trying to decide between flow cytometry and mass cytometry. Um, before Michelle speaks, Dr. Rao, would you just want to ask this last part to it? How do we design experiments to improve the number of cells that we obtain data from? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we found was particularly important was to make sure that the cells are well fixed, so really fixed in a, um, in a robust way because, you know, the, the last step is going to put those cells into distilled water. And so if, if they're not really fixed robustly, um, fill lice at that point and you can lose a fair number of cells. We've tried to, to um, improve the ways that we're pelleting the cells to get them down at the bottom of the tubes and not lose them in the washes. Um, these are some of the steps that we found are, are the spots that we were losing cells, substantial number of cells along the way. Dr. Poulin? Um, so I would, one, I would agree with uh, what Dr. Rao said. The fixation step is critical. Um, to have better recovery of your cells throughout the uh, processing. Um, it's also very important that not only should the fixation step be robust, but it's very important to use um, freshly diluted formaldehyde. Um, formaldehyde, um, as it's exposed to air, will oxidize first to formic acid and then back to paraformaldehyde, and that really impacts its ability to do an effective fixation of the cells. So always using fresh formaldehyde is important. Um, just due to the way that cells are focused um, on the front end of the instrument into the plasma does incur some loss. Um, this is reduced on um, our Helios mass cytometer. In some cases, um, people will get uh, actually a 60 to 70% recovery but there is some cell loss, although it is random and not uh, cell population specific. But um, that does require uh, an input of more cells up front if you need to get a certain amount of, of, of um, events out in the data file. Okay. Dr. Rao, could we use these technologies for paraffin-fixed formalin biopsy FFPE samples? I don't think so. Um, for the for the cellular analysis here, you need intact cells that you can get out into a single cell suspension. I don't I don't think it's possible from FFPE. That's 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 my understanding of it. Uh, this next one is for you too. Can you follow your CCR2 positive cells migration in vivo, and do these cells have potential to go through malignant transition as a result of chronic inflammation? Uh, so the second part, I have no idea. The first part, um, I, I think following the cells is a, um, um, it's an interesting question. It's something that's probably more easily addressed in, in mouse models than in human, you know, the human studies. We tend to in vitro migration assays, and, and I think they behave as you would expect. Um, but following the cells in vivo is, is, gonna, is, is probably most easily addressed in the mouse model. Okay. We'll pause for just a quick second here. We are almost out of time. You know what? As we are almost out of time, um, I, I would um, just like to thank Dr. Poulin and Dr. Rao for their presentations and uh, ask if you have any final comments. Well, I've, I've, thanks, uh, thanks to the audience for, for, for being here, and thanks for the opportunity to, to present this work. Um, 
you know, I think we're optimistic about this technology and the ability to, to use this technology in, in, in combination with others in a sort of synergistic way to learn more about, the, the, in particular, the, the immune cell populations that infiltrate tissues and inflammatory diseases. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Poulin, we have another question for you here before you have closing comments. Um, once we've opened a new vial of formaldehyde, how long do you suggest we use it before opening a new one? Um, usually what we recommend is if you have a, an ampule of formaldehyde that you've opened, that once it's opened, you then store it in a 15 mil conical tube uh, wrapped in foil to protect it um, from the light and store it at four degrees and then use that um, within a week. Okay, and Dr. Um, Rowe, another, and, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Judy, sorry. Oh, no, no, please, please, uh, please finish because we have another one from Dr. Rao, so please finish. Um, no, that, uh, that was actually, I was done. Oh, okay. Um, Dr. Rao, what controls should you use in Cytoff? Um, so I, I think the question is probably getting at te technical controls, um, and um, I'm trying to anticipate where the question is coming from. I think, so for one, um, there is this difficulty about using isotype controls in Cytos just because there's so many antibodies. Um, and I, I don't necessarily think that I have the right approach here, but I can tell you what we do, which is that um, when we put together panels, so for one, we try to use antibody clones that are that, that are um, established to have a good performance by flow cytometry. Um, for the panels, once we've set up a panel and stain the stain of cell population, um, we are looking for whether the antibody staining follows the expected pattern for the for the stains that we know what they should look like. That is the CD4 signal should be on the CD3 positive cells. The CD8 signal should be separate from the CD4 signal um, and sort of following the signals down. Then four markers of particular interest will um, we'll use some of the same tricks that I think we're familiar with from flow cytometry, which is either to leave out one antibody and, see, and make sure that the signal goes away, to use an isotype control for the stains that are dim or are particular importance. Um, and um, um, and I think that then, then there are then there are experimental controls of you know uh, you know test controls versus um, versus no stimulation controls. I think that those will follow the same rules in Cytoff as as in other experimental setups. Right, Dr. Poulin, do you have final thoughts you'd like to share? Um, I don't have any in particular, but I did just want to um, say thank you to Dr. Rao, and I was very happy to be part of um, this webinar. Um, his work is very interesting, and I'm, I'm very excited to see more coming out of his research. Great. Thank you both once again, and I would also like to thank our sponsor, Fluidime, for making today's educational webcast possible. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That is all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.